Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Trailblazer the John Muir Trail. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing the first couple of rounds today. Now, before I go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as a subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to support this channel, you'll gain access to exclusive perks, like watching my opinions episodes where I talk about all the games that I'm playing recently, and you can also watch some videos early and advertisement free, and you can learn all about that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. The final thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this video, some part of the game really jumps out to you, or maybe you see a turn that should have gone differently, then please comment about that down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. The other thing I do need to mention is the fact that this is a prototype version of the game. That means the art, components, and potentially rules might be different in the final version, so keep that in mind while you're watching. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Now, in it, each player is a hiker going along the iconic John Muir Trail in the California Sierra. This hike is going to take place over 12 days, and the ultimate goal for all players is to reach the top of Mount Whitney, which is the highest peak in the region. During each one of the game's days, players are going to use their track tokens to do a wide variety of things as they are hiking along the trail. They might gather natural resources, and they can also discover flora and fauna along the way. In addition to that, players can explore incredible vistas, and of course, they can actually hike along this trail. Now, most of the things that you do in this game are going to use up various natural resources or personal resources. At the end of each day, you do need some food and some water in order to stay healthy on the trail. In order to successfully complete this hike, each player has a wide variety of tools at their disposal. As we are playing the game, we are going to place various tools into our backpacks or add various patches to our backpacks to illustrate the various things we've overcome and seen. And we can use those patches and equipment to also increase our elevation ranking in the game. This will give us access to new track tokens so that we can do more things. And it will also give us access to these scoring arrowhead tokens, which give us conditional things to work towards to gain extra track points once the game is over. Once we've finished 12 full days, every player who successfully reached Mount Whitney can score their points. They get this for a variety of things, including the points they got during the game, and then the player with the most points is the winner. That does mean that if you do not reach the peak of Mount Whitney, you are not even eligible to win the game. Now that was just a high-level overview of the game, and I will explain in detail how all of this works while we're playing, and on that note, I think let's start the game. Now each one of the game's 12 days has three different phases, sunrise, daytime, and sunset. We begin with sunrise, and the first thing we do for that phase is draw a random weather token from one of these stacks. We flip that over, and then we put it down onto the day we are currently at. It looks like the weather today is cloudy, but fortunately, there are no other icons on this. That means while we can't really see the sun, we're not going to have any extra hardships. Several of the tokens in here will actually make us need to spend extra resources in order to hike along the trail, but fortunately, that's not the case today. I'm sure we'll see some more extreme weather as we continue along through this hike, but for now we can move on. And the next thing that we all do during the sunrise phase is play a single trail card. Now this happens in player order, and we are playing as the red player, and we also have the trail blazer medallion, which means we are the starting player. Now before we actually play a trail card, we always draw a random one from the deck and put it into our hand, and then we choose one of these to play, and we gain all of the benefits listed on that card. Now these cards are green as well as red, although the red cards are thematically obstacles that work the same way as green. So if we play this red card, it says blister, and that essentially means we have toughed out through a blister, and overcoming this is going to give us various benefits. Another option could be a perfect day, which is a lot better than a blister, and this is going to give various different benefits. Now, speaking of those benefits, these are the reasons we actually play these cards, and I do also want to mention that there is a variant where you have extra things you need to do in order to overcome these obstacles, but in the base game, the obstacles and the trail cards are functionally identical. So, once again, we are going to play a card first, and I think I like the idea of playing the Find a Heart-Shaped Rock Trail card. As you can see, we are going to gain these benefits up along the top. The one on the right is a natural resource, and that is the Earth resource. We simply take that from the supply on the board, and we put it down onto our own personal board. And when we focus in, you can see we started with two Earth resources. We also have two water, one wind, and one fire. 
Now, we do have a restriction in that we cannot have more than 12 of these natural resources total. If we are at 12, then we are not allowed to take any more until we spend down under that limit. We started with 6, so now we're at 7, so that means we're fine for the limit. Now, the other benefit on this card shows a backpack item. As you can see, it has that hexagonal icon to show this. Now, that specific icon is a patch. It's the Yosemite Conservancy patch. And whenever you gain a benefit that shows a backpack icon, you first look at your backpack to see if that's there. If it isn't, then you look up to your supply and you find it, and you then add it to your backpack. If instead that icon was already in your backpack, you would gain an elevation bonus. But since this wasn't in our backpack already, I'll explain how that elevation bonus works later on. Now, whenever you add things into your backpack, you always go as far down and to the left as possible. So that means the first one goes here, the second goes there, and the third goes there. Then it goes 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, every time you add a third thing to your backpack, you then gain access to a benefit that's associated with that specific column. Once you put three in, you can gain one natural resource of your choice. Once you put six in, you can gain one personal resource of your choice. The personal resources are food, water, rest, and conditioning. Once you add nine things to your backpack, you gain two personal resources. And I do want to mention once again that this is a prototype version of the game, so it does not have the icon for two personal resources, but that's changed since I got this. If you complete your backpack, backpack by adding all 12 of the items, you then get 5 victory points. So we've added a Yosemite Conservancy patch to our backpack, and once again in the future if we ever gain that benefit, we will go up on the elevation chart, which I will describe later on. So we started the morning by finding a heart-shaped rock, and now we can put this into a communal discard pile. Now that we are done, play is going to move clockwise to the yellow player, and they also draw a trail card and then play one. It looks like they're going to start their morning by watching bear cubs play. This is going to gain them one earth natural resource, and they can also add binoculars into their bag, and they can use these for the rest of the game. Finally, in our three-player game, the blue player gets to draw one of these and play. And it looks like they're going to start their morning by catching and releasing a golden trout from the river. This is going to get them the fishing pole, which they add into their backpack. It will also give them a earth natural resource, and it will get them a food personal resource. Personal resources are placed down over here, and we do have a limit of those as well. And it's listed by these dots down below. You cannot have more than four food or four water. You also can't have more than three rest or three conditioning tokens. So they are at their maximum of food, and I'm sure they'll find ways to eat that throughout this hike. At this point, we've all played a trail card, so that means the sunrise phase of the first day is over. Now we can move into the daytime phase, where most of the gameplay actually happens. We perform this phase in clockwise order, so that means we can start things off. And on your turn during the daytime phase, you have to place one of your track tokens down onto a valid spot on the board, and you then immediately perform that specific area's ability. Each player starts with three of these tokens, and we can gain more of them as we increase our elevation, which again, I'll explain later on. Now, there are seven different types of things that we can do by placing this track token down, and I think we are going to start by heading down here and discovering something to add to our field guide. So let's focus over here, and as you can see, there are five of these field guide cards face up. Now, in order to take one of these, we have to pay the resources indicated at the top. That's two water, a water and an earth, a water and a wind, a water and a fire, or two different natural resources, which again are water, earth, wind, and fire. Now, I think we want to go over here and take this western tanager. That means we have to spend a water and earth natural resource. We gained an extra earth during the sunrise phase, so we certainly have enough of those. We can spend these, and we still have at least one of each of the other types. These will go back onto the board into the supplies. And then we take this field guide card and then put our track token onto the spot that was revealed when that card was removed. This is going to stay here for the rest of the day, and obviously no one else can do anything here since we removed the card and put a token down. After that, we can gain all rewards at the bottom of the card. Now, this shows the binoculars gear, so we can add that right into our own backpack. And then after that, this is just going to give us two trail points. Having the most trail points is how you win, so getting two right off the bat does seem pretty good. Now, the other icon here shows the type of field guide card this is. In particular, this is a bird type, and that is going to be important for end game scoring. We're actually going to place this into a face down pile, which we can look at at any time. And once the game is over, we are going to score points for the sets of different 
types of icons that we have within our field guide cards. So now that we have a bird, we're going to try to take the other types. There are five total, although if we get another bird, that'll simply work towards another set, and I'll explain how this set collection scoring works in detail later on in the tutorial. All right, that's finished our turn, so now play can go clockwise, and the yellow player has decided they are also going to discover a field guide card. In particular, they are going to go over here. That's going to cost them a water and a wind natural resource, which means they have one water left, and that was their only wind resource that they had. After that, they can take this card. It looks like they have discovered a Jeffrey Pine. Next up, they can gain the benefits listed on this card. As you can see in the middle, there is an option. This lets them either take a fire natural resource, or they can add a patch to their bag. Now when it comes to the items that are added to the bag, there are gear items as well as patches. There are three different types of patches and nine pieces of gear that you can add. This will let them add one patch to their backpack, and they've decided to go with the Wilderness First Responder patch. Next up, there is another bonus on this card, and that shows the binoculars. Now, as you can see, they already have their binoculars in their backpack. They added those earlier on in this day by playing a trail card. Whenever you gain a benefit for a token that is already in your backpack, instead of adding something else to your backpack, you get to activate and use that specific item. So they're going to use the binoculars they have in their backpack to look at this Jeffrey Pine, and whenever you use something that's in your backpack already, you increase your elevation chart ranking by one. The elevation chart is right over here, and the first time you do this, you take your tent token and put it onto the one spot of this track, and every subsequent time you utilize something that's already in your backpack, which again means you gain a benefit of an icon that's already there, you simply increase yourself along this track heading once to the right. Before moving on, let's focus over here on the elevation chart a little bit more. As you can see, every third spot on this track has a benefit. Once you get to the third spot, you can take one natural resource, and once you get to the sixth spot, that unlocks another track token that you can add onto your board and use immediately on that turn and for the rest of the game. As you can see, once you get up to the 12th elevation, that will unlock your fifth and final track token. So as you increase your elevation by utilizing the things you've already added to your backpack, you'll get to accomplish more things during each of the game's subsequent daytime phases. Let's now look at the other end of the track, and as you can see, there are 21 spots. Now, as soon as you reach the final spot, you then gain the associated benefit, which I'll explain in just a second, and you then place your tracker token onto the highest available bonus. You then gain those victory points immediately. So there is definitely an incentive to quickly race down this elevation track in order to get these points. In addition to that, three times along this track, you can gain access to that specific benefit, which lets you take a Journey Bonus Arrowhead token. In the middle of the board, as you can see, there are three stacks of these, and there's a face-up token on the top of each. Every time you get one of those icons, you get to take one of these three face-up tokens. After you take it, you then reveal the next one underneath it, and each one of these are going to be conditional end-game bonus points for you based off of how well you actually meet that condition. For example, if you have this one, it will be worth one extra point up to a maximum of five for each animal type of field guide card you've discovered throughout the game. For example, this Pika is currently out at the market, and it has that animal icon. So, as you can see, this elevation track is very important. It not only gets you access to more actions during the daytime phase, but it also gives you goals to work towards with these conditional endgame victory point tokens, and by getting to the end first, you get even more points than your opponents if they are also able to get to the end of that track. Well, at this point, the yellow player is done with their turn, so that means the blue player can go. After considering all of their options, they've decided they'd like to explore a destination card. You do this by placing a track token down onto an empty icon over here, and as you can see, there's always three of these available. In a three-player game, there's a fourth available, and in a four-player game, all five are. That means in this three-player game, this spot isn't available to any of us, and four of these exploration actions can happen during each of the game's days. Now, the way the explore action works is the active player can take one of these destination cards. There's always going to be three of them available, and in order to take a destination card, they must pay all of the required resources listed in the middle of the card. If they do this, then they will gain all of the benefits on the card, which could be backpack items as well as victory points, and there are also different types of these destination cards, which can potentially be important as the game goes on. Out of these three options, the blue player has decided they would like to explore Duck Pass. Now, as you can see at the bottom of the card, they have to spend one water, 
earth as well as wind natural resource, and they also have to spend one water personal resource, which is a water bottle that the blue player has on them. Everybody starts with two of these water bottles, so they will spend one of those, and they have now spent everything they need in order to explore duck paths. Now, the next thing that happens is they gain access to this backpack item. Obviously, it's not in their backpack just yet, so they can find those hiking poles and add those into their backpack. And of course, if they already had those in their backpack, instead of adding it here, they would go up once on the elevation track. Now, they did add this to their backpack, and the next thing they get is four trail points. So, blue goes up to four total. Next up, the player can put this card in front of them, and the first time a player gains a specific type of destination card, they get a benefit that's listed on their board. Now, this is the blue player's first peaks and pass type destination card, so that means they will activate that specific benefit right over here. When we focus in, that says they can take two natural resources, but they have to be different, and then they can take this token and cover up that spot to show that they have officially taken at least one of these. This means they won't get this benefit anymore throughout the game, and they are, of course, incentivized to get at least one of the other types to gain those benefits. This one right here lets you either add a gear type of equipment to your backpack or activate gear in your backpack to increase your elevation once. That one there lets you take a random field guide card from the top of the deck, flip it over, and gain all benefits on it without having to pay anything. And finally, this one lets you draw two trail cards from the top of the deck and then play one. You get all benefits for that, and this effectively increases your trail card hand size by one because you drew two and played one. And for the rest of the game, you'll have a standing hand size for your trail cards of four. Now, once a player has put a token on all of these spots, which means they have at least one of each of the different types of destination cards, they will immediately gain five trail points. And the first person to do this will gain the Sequoia Medallion. Now, these medallions are worth victory points at the end of the game, and it varies from one medallion to the next. The Sequoia Medallion is worth two points per player in the game. So in this three-player game, taking this is a six-point benefit for that player. There are other medallions in the game, and I'll explain how these work as we go along. Well, let's focus back over here because the blue player does get to activate this benefit. That lets them take two natural resources that are different, so they will take one wind, and they'll take one water. Blue can finish their turn by revealing a new destination card, and we draw them from the current destination card deck. There's three of these decks, and the other two will become unlocked later on as we hike down this trail, and I'll explain how that works later on. With blue done, that means we get to go again, and we do still have two of these track tokens left. Now, I think let's also explore a destination card. And in particular, let's go to Sunrise Lakes. Now, this just costs a water and fire natural resource, and it only gets us one point. But there are two other reasons why I think this is a good card to take. The first is the fact that it shows the Yosemite Conservancy patch in the bottom left and we already have one of those patches on our backpack. Now, before I get ahead of myself, we do need to spend our water, and that's our last water for now, as well as our fire, and we are out of the fire natural resource as well. Next up, since we have this over here, instead of adding it onto our backpack, the bonus will let us increase our elevation by one. This is the first time we're doing that in this game, so we can place this token on the first spot of the elevation track. That's right over here. Next up, Sunrise Lake will get us one victory point, so that will bring us up to three. Next up, we can place this in front of us, and this is a lakes type of destination card. It's our first lakes destination in the game, so that means we can activate this bonus and cover up that spot. Now, this says we draw the top field guide card from the deck, and it looks like we found an Osprey. Now, we get all of the benefits on this, so that is going to be one of the wind natural resource. We already had one, and now we have two. This is also going to add the fishing rod to our backpack. We can put that right over here, and as soon as we do that, we have completed one of these rows of our backpack, which means we get this bonus, and that lets us take one natural resource of our choice. I think let's take fire, and then we can add this to our stack of these field guide cards. It looks like we somehow have two birds already. Remember, we want sets of different icons, so we're definitely going to avoid birds in the future, but having both of these is not a bad thing at this point in the game. Now, I did mention that there were two key reasons why I wanted to take this card. The first of those was going up the elevation track because of this, and the other one is the fact that this lake icon matches up with a special endgame scoring condition right over here on the Golden Arrowhead token. 
During setup, we took a random arrowhead token and we placed it right over here, and this is a benefit that all players will gain access to once the game is over. As you can see, this is all about lakes. If you have two lake cards at the end of the game, it's three points. If you have three, it's five, and if you have four or more, it's seven. Now, it's even better than that because the benefits on this golden arrowhead card are doubled for all players. So that means we would actually get six, 10, or 14 points if we have two, three, or four of those late cards at the end of the game. Again, this applies to all players, so during this play, those lakes over there on the destination card row are much more lucrative than in other plays of the game where something like this could have been out here instead. Once again, once you place this during setup, that will be the only one out there for the entire game. All of the other arrowheads we take are personal conditions that each player will score by themselves. All right, it's now time for yellow to go. And they've decided they want to explore more. In particular, they're going to go right over here. The payment to take this field guide card is two different natural resources, and they are going to spend a water and earth natural resource to take this. They can put their track token there, and then this pika will get them one water natural resource, and that will also add these hiking poles into their backpack. That has completed this row right over here, so that lets them take one natural resource of their choice. And they don't currently have any wind, so they think taking wind is a good idea. After that, the blue player can go. And they are also going to discover, in this case, that's going to be an alpine lily. This will cost them a water and fire natural resource. And then this alpine lily shows those hiking poles that are already in their backpack. This means their elevation will go up once. So they are also at the start of that track now. And then the other benefit lets them take another field guide card straight from the top of the deck and gain those benefits. This is an incense cedar that is going to add a camping chair to their backpack, and it will also get them one fire natural resource. In addition to that, we can see they just completed this row right over here. That will let them take a natural resource of their choice, and they've decided to take water. Well, blue is done with their turn, which means it's time for us to go again, and we have just one track token left. Now, we can do a wide variety of things still, but one thing in particular I do want to talk about is hiking over here on the John Muir Trail. Now, this is a very important part of the game because, as you can see, the trail is 10 spaces long, and every player who does not reach the 10th spot by the end of 12 days will lose the game. They can count up their score if they want to, but they are not eligible to win. In order to hike on the trail, you have to put one of your track tokens down onto the matching spot for your color, and then you can move one space forward as long as you can pay the associated requirements. Now, you can only do this once per day, and remember, there are 12 days and 10 steps. That means two out of the 12 days can have you not hiking, but you are going to have to hike 10 times throughout this game in 10 of these days, otherwise you are just going to lose. So that means right now we could use this to do something else and have this day be one of the two where we don't hike, but I think now is a good time for us to hike, so let's go ahead and place our token here. Now, as I mentioned before, you do have to pay resources in order to hike along this trail. The first thing that you have to check is your map pack. During setup, every player got one of these. Each of them has icons down below on these cards that are associated with the 10 steps along the trail, and every map pack has the same set of these icons, but they're all distributed differently across each one of the different hiking locations. Now, in order to hike into a specific spot, you have to go to that map pack page and pay the associated resource showing. For us, in order to go to the first spot on the hike, we have to pay one wind, whereas for the yellow player, you can see they have to pay a fire, and the blue player has to pay one water natural resource token. Now, if we want to, we can look all the way through this pack. We can see that in order to go to the second spot, we will need fire, and on the fourth spot, we'll need some earth as well as wind. So you can plan ahead, looking to see what the various requirements are as you plan this track. So you always have to pay the resource on the map pack page, but there are two other requirements that you might have to deal with. The first of these involves weather. If there is an icon on the weather tile that was drawn that shows a resource, then you must also pay that resource in order to hike ahead. The reason we should hike in this first day is because it's cloudy, but that's not extreme weather, and it has no extra requirements on it. So in the future, if we have one come up that shows resources, we'll have to pay those. So having no weather penalty makes the first day a great one to go hiking. 
The final requirement that you might have to meet shows up on these John Muir Trail tokens. At the start of the game, we randomly placed these out onto locations 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And in order to go onto that spot with a hike action, you have to either pay the associated resource, like this one water bottle personal resource, or you have to have the indicated badge or gear currently in your backpack. When we focus in, you can see in order to go to location 6 on the trail, we each have to have a Wilderness First Responder patch, and location 7 is going to require some hiking poles. Now at this point, I'm sure you're wondering, what happens if you can't meet these requirements? Well, you're always allowed to hike ahead just by putting your token down here, but for every requirement that you can't meet, you have to take a single hardship token, and these are worth a significant number of negative points once the game is over. So that means right now, if we did not pay this one wind, we would take one hardship token instead. This also means if you need to hike into a spot that's associated with a patch or a gear item that you don't have in your backpack and that you can't find a way to add into your backpack, well, you can still hike onto that spot and just take a hardship token for that one specific requirement. The requirements that you have to cover range from one all the way up to four. If this maybe showed two things, that showed one thing, and this shows a thing. And if you want to, you could forego all four of those and take four hardship tokens. But if that's your plan, you're probably not going to end up winning the game. Now, before we actually perform this action, there's two more things I'd like to mention. The first of these is that the last spot is always climbing up to the top of Mount Whitney, which is something you have to do in order to count your points at the end of the game, and this location always requires the use of a second track token. That means you place one over here for the action, and then a second one on top, and this is the only time in the game where you can put two tokens over here, and it's just a cost of two tokens to do that single action. And of course, in our case, we will also have to pay one water personal resource. The last thing I'd like to mention is what happens once you do reach the end and get to the top of Mount Whitney. Well, the first player to do that is going to get five points, the second player will get three, and the third player will get one. If it's a four-player game, then the fourth player does not get any points. Now, the first player, in addition to getting these five points, will also take the Windrose Medallion, and they will keep that for the rest of the game, and during final scoring, this Windrose Medallion is worth one point per player in the game. So in this three-player game, that's worth three points. Remember, this medallion over here that you get for being the first one to get all four of the different types of destinations gets you two points per player. Now that we know how to hike, let's actually go for it. We start over here at the Happy Isles, and the first spot we go to is going to be the number one spot. That is going to cost us one wind, as I mentioned before, and we don't have to pay any weather penalties because none showed up on the tile that was drawn. Also, there are none of the extra requirement tokens on the trail until we hit the fifth spot, so that means we just pay one wind, and then we'll successfully hike to the first location. Fortunately, we have one wind, in fact we have two, so we'll spend this one, and that's completed our action. After that, the yellow player can go, and they also want to get in on some hiking while the weather is nice. They are going to have to pay one fire from their map pack. There is also no penalty for weather, and there are none of these extra requirement tokens. So they will pay one fire, which they do have, and that's finished their hike. Of course, once you travel to a new location, you can simply flip your map pack over to easily see what the next spot on the trail is going to cost for you. So, yellow will also proceed to the first area, and now it's time for the blue player to go. They have just one action left, but instead of hiking, they're going to head back over here and discover another field guide card. The only one remaining on the board is this one, and that's Rafferty Creek. That's going to cost them two water natural resources, which they just barely have, and then they can take this field guide card. Now we can see the bonuses are going to be a single condition personal resource, so they can add that onto their board, and then this icon is new. As you can see, that is not a backpack hexagonal icon, instead it shows the track token. What this means is as a bonus, the blue player can take the action token that they used for this action, and they can put it back onto their board, and they can use it again later on in this day, and then they will of course keep this card and add it to the rest that they have. Blue is done, so that means we could go, but we don't have any track tokens, so we pass. The yellow player also passes, which means the blue player can once again take their turn. They have this action token they can use again, and they are tempted to go hiking. The problem for them is they just spent all of their water natural resources, and they need to spend one of those in order to successfully hike to the first location. Now, they could do this. They would simply take one hardship token, and there are ways to lose hardship tokens as the game goes on. And, of course, another thing they could do is just do another action, and then have this first day be one of the two where they don't hike. 
After considering those options, they are going to go hiking, and they're simply going to take a hardship token. So they can grab that right out of the supply and put it in front of them. Once the game is over, if you have one hardship token, you lose four points. If you have two, you lose nine points. If you have three, you lose 16 points. And if you have four of these hardship tokens, you lose 25 points. So these are a significant thing to take, but it looks like the blue player feels they have lots of time to remove it at some point later on in the game. Well, at this point, everyone has used all of their track tokens, so that means the daytime phase of the first day has come to an end. We can now move into the third and final phase, which is sunset, and the first thing that happens is all players are going to have to consume one food and one water from their personal resources. If in this moment a player does not have the food and or the water, then they take one hardship token for each one of those resources that they cannot use. At this moment only, players are also allowed to turn in two water natural resources to gain one water personal resource. So that means you can keep a bunch of water in front of you and cash it out for these water bottles in order to hydrate as the day comes to an end. Fortunately for everybody, we all have food and water to spend. And now everyone can take back all of their track tokens. The next thing we have to do is refresh the field guide cards. If there was a card in the leftmost spot, then we would discard it. And then after that, we slide all of the cards down and then refresh the market by drawing from the top of the deck. As you can see, in the first day, we took all of them. So let's go ahead and draw five new cards for the second day of the game. As you can see, there are a couple of these creek cards, and as we saw before, every single creek gives you that bonus that brings that action token back that you can then use later on in the same day, and the other bonuses can range from things like resources to simply getting points. At this point, it's time to potentially resolve the first light medallion. That's right over here in the top right corner of the board, and at this moment, if the medallion is on the board, then we take one water natural resource and we add it on top of it. Now, instead of that, it's possible that this wouldn't be here because as an action during the daytime phase, somebody can place a track token onto this spot and they then take this first light medallion as well as all of the water natural resources on top of it, which they then put onto their board. They then keep this medallion in front of them. So at this point in the sunset phase, we would not add any water down because the medallion would not be on the board. Of course, that's not the case for us in this first round though. Nobody took this, so that means we simply add one water on top of it. After that, the final step to the sunset phase involves passing the Trailblazer medallion one step clockwise unless somebody took the first light medallion. If somebody took that medallion, they would have it in front of themselves right now, and that player would take this Trailblazer token instead of having this pass clockwise. In that instance, we would put this in front of the player who has the first light token. We would then put the first light token onto the board and put a single water token on top of it for the next round of the game. Obviously, nobody took it in the first day, so that means the Trailblazer token will simply pass clockwise over here, and that means the yellow player will be the starting player for the next day of the game. All right, the first day is over, which means we can now move into the second day of the game, and we begin with a sunrise phase. Just like always, we take a random weather token from the top of one of these stacks, and oh, it looks like the weather is not so good on day two. This is a thunderstorm, and as you can see, it shows a fire natural resource. That means in order to hike today, we all have to spend one fire natural resource or take one hardship token. I do want to mention that the majority of these weather tiles do not have extreme weather on them. They're either cloudy, somewhat cloudy, or sunny, and they don't have any penalty icons on them. So maybe today is going to be a good day for some of us to skip on the trail, or maybe some of us will forge forward being able to spend that fire token. After that, each player in order is going to draw a trail card and then play one from their hand. After thinking through their options, Yellow has decided they want to start their day off by chatting with a backcountry ranger. As you can see, this lets them take any natural resource of their choice, and they're going to take a fire token, probably because of the thunderstorm that's happening, and then the other benefit shows these hiking poles. When we look down at their backpack, we can see they already have those hiking poles in their backpack, so they can use those, which will push them up once on the elevation track. After that, the blue player can draw one trail card and then play one. And it looks like they're going to start their morning off a little bit more treacherously than the yellow player because they have lost the trail. Now, this is an obstacle type of trail card. And remember, in the standard way to play the game, this is just a thematic obstacle. They overcame being lost on the trail, and they'll gain all of these benefits. 
As I mentioned before, you can play with an expert variant, where in order to play an obstacle card, you must have that indicated item already in your backpack. And if you do, you gain the benefit, but then of course you can't play this if you don't have it. I do want to mention that during the sunrise phase of the game, when you play a card, you could choose any card from your hand and discard it, not taking any of the listed benefits, but you do gain one water. Now, this is something you pretty much never do unless you're playing with that expert variant, and we are not using that today. So they simply got lost on the trail and then found their way. Now, this lets them take one natural resource, and we can check their pack and see that they do indeed have these hiking poles. That means they can use those in order to go up once on the elevation track. And then when they take a natural resource, they do want to look ahead in their map pack. and They can see they're going to need an earth natural resource in order to hike to the next spot if they want to today. They do have a couple earth, and they do have a fire for that thunderstorm. And it looks like they've decided for this bonus to take another fire token. After that, we get to draw a trail card, and now we have to play one of these. This right here would add a camping chair to our pack, which we don't have, and it would also get us one conditioning. This one would let us uh, add a camera to our backpack, and we would get one of each type of water. The next option would let us add a first aid kit to our backpack, and we'd take one natural resource. And the last one would get us a wind and fire natural resource. Out of all of these, I think I like the idea of visiting Rose Lake at sunrise best. That is going to add a camera into our backpack, so we can place that right over here. And then we will take one water natural resource, and we'll take a water personal resource as well. Well, the sun is fully risen, and now it's daytime. The yellow player has the Trail Blazer Medallion, so that means they get to place the first track token of the day. After considering all of the options, they've decided to explore a destination. In particular, they want to head to Vernal Falls. This is going to cost them one Water and Wind Natural Resource. It will then activate their Wilderness First Responder Patch because it's already there in their pack. So that means they can go up once on the Elevation Chart which will bring them to the third location on that chart and the first bonus. This lets them take one natural resource of their choice. And considering they now don't have any more water natural resources and they'll need that to hike to the next spot, they've decided to take one of those for the bonus. After that, they will gain one trail point for visiting Vernal Falls. And then they can place this in front of them. This is the first falls and features type of destination that they've had, so they can place this right over there. That is going to activate this bonus, which lets them draw two more trail cards. They can add those to their hand, and then they immediately play one of them, just like they do during the sunrise phase of the day. After considering these options, they've decided to be a good citizen of the trail, and they are going to carry out other people's trash that got left behind. This is going to add a leave no trace patch to their backpack and it will get them one trail point immediately. So they now have two. Yellow's turn has come to an end, and they can finish it by revealing another destination card. That is Half Dome. Now that is quite the destination. It has the Leave No Trace patch, but you also have to spend one water, two earth, and a wind natural resources, along with some food and rest personal resources, but you do get 10 points for exploring Half Dome. With Yellow done, that means the blue player can go and they've decided to perform the first Acquire Natural Resources action of the game. By this point, it's likely you've noticed these spots over here associated with the various supplies of these natural resources. Now, one player can put a track token down onto one of these spots, and then they gain the indicated amount of that natural resource. So that would be four water for going here, three earth for going there, two wind for going up there, and finally one fire for going over here. Now, in a two- or three-player game, only one person can go to each one of these spots, but in a four-player game, two different people can visit these locations to acquire those resources. Of course, this is a three-player game, though, so that means Blue is the only player who's going to activate this for this entire second day of the game, and when they do that, they are going to gain four water natural resources. So they can put those onto their board. They currently have nine natural resources, so they haven't exceeded their maximum of 12. Well, Blue is done with their turn, so now we can go, and I'm a little bummed. They went over here. We kind of need water. We only have one water natural resource, and I suppose we don't need it to hike, but a lot of these field guide cards do have water for their cost, and the same can be said for these destination cards. Now, one way we could get water is through playing trail cards, and specifically we could do that by using a new action that we haven't talked about just yet called the Mountain Pass. Only one player can go here in each one of the game's days, 
And when a player goes here, they draw two trail cards from the top of the deck, and then they play two trail cards from their hand so that they keep the same overall hand size. Now, when you play trail cards using the Mountain Pass effect, you ignore any of the gear or patch benefits shown on those cards. So you only get the right-hand things, not the left-hand things that show up on these. Honestly, I think this could be good for us, so let's go for it. That means we are going to draw two trail cards into our hand, and now we have to play two of them. Again, we ignore any of these patch or gear icons. So that means we could take a condition with this card. This one would get us a wind and a fire natural resource. That would get us one natural resource of our choice. This would get us a fire, and that one would immediately get us two trail points. Out of all of these options, I think we should play this one for sure because we wouldn't even be foregoing a backpack icon because it doesn't have any on it. For the other one, though, I feel like let's go with the blister obstacle. We are foregoing this first aid kit gear icon, but that would let us take one natural resource of our choice. So we're going to keep these in our hand for the future, and now we'll take a wind, a fire, and then one natural resource of our choice, and I think we'll take a water. So we can place those onto our board, and that's finished our turn. This means the yellow player can go, and they've decided they want to take the first light medallion. Yellow currently has the Trailblazer medallion, and if no one took this, then that medallion would be passed clockwise to the blue player, and then the yellow player would be last in turn order in the next day. By going over here, they are taking the first light token, they get these two water natural resources, and this means they will be the starting player for the next day instead of being the last player in turn order. They of course did get these two water resources, and that's another reason they did this. They only have one water resource, and the next spot on their map pack requires one. And of course, the blue player already went to the acquire water spot out there on the board. Well, yellow is done with their turn, so blue can go. And they've decided to discover a field guide card. In particular, they're going to discover this one, which will cost them two water natural resources. They had four, so now they have two remaining. This card will get them two trail points immediately, and then it will add a camera into their backpack. Well, blue is done, which means we get to go again, and we have two of these track tokens remaining. Now, up to this point, we've talked about just about all of the action spots, except for these five over here at the High Sierra Lodge. The reason we haven't talked about these yet is because currently no one has access to the lodge. In order to place a track token over onto any of these, that player must have at least reached the fourth spot on the John Muir Trail. Since players can only hike at most once per day, that means the earliest players can gain access to the High Sierra Lodge is in the fourth day of the game. That being said, let's focus over here and talk about how these action spots work. They're pretty simple. When you put a token down, you get the personal resources listed above it for these four. That's three food, two bottled water, one rest, or one conditioning. Now, these spots over here also can have multiple tokens placed on it. So we could go there, blue could go there, and the yellow player could also go onto the same spot. The only restriction is the same player is not allowed to go to the same spot more than once within a given day. There's one more action spot at the High Sierra Lodge, which is this one, and that simply lets you return one hardship token from your board back to the general supply so that it does not cost you points once the game is over. So, the fourth spot on the trail is very important, and before we move on, I'd now like to talk about why the fifth spot as well as the ninth spots are also important here on the trail. Now, you may have noticed these icons that show up on the trail, and these are associated with the different destination card decks that are over by the side of the board. At the start of the game, we only use the green backed destination cards because we are at the beginning of the trail, and as soon as any player reaches the fifth spot on the trail, we will discard all of the green backed cards from the deck as well as the face up cards. We will then take the blue deck out and reveal three cards from it, and then all players, no matter where they are on the trail, will then have the ability to explore those destinations. Likewise, once any player reaches the ninth spot on the trail, we will then get rid of all of the blue cards, whether they are face up or face down, and then we will have the final stack of these brown backed cards, and from this deck we will then flip three of them face up. Once again, it does not matter where you are on the trail, you can always explore any of the face up cards, even if they are a card back that is ahead of you on the trail. Well, it's once again our turn, and I think let's go over here and explore a destination. In particular, I think let's explore Cloud's Rest. 
that shows a hammock, so we can add that into our backpack. It does mean we're not advancing on the elevation track, but the more of these that we put in our backpack, the quicker we get to these bonuses, and of course, the more likely we are to go up with those elevation bumps because we would likely already have those matching icons. Now, this is going to cost us one water, two earth, one wind natural resource, as well as a bottle of water from our personal resources. That's pretty expensive, but I think it'll be worth it. Now I jumped the gun, now is the time that we would place this into our backpack, and then we can gain seven points. We were at three, so that jumps us all the way up to 10. After that, we can see this is the first of that type of destination that we've acquired. So we can place this token here. We now have two out of the four types, and that lets us immediately take two natural resources that cannot be the same type. In this situation, I think we should take a water as well as a fire. We do have two fire already, but I am planning on spending both of these hiking on our next turn, and I think having another one left behind will be good for us as we continue through the game. Our turn is done, so we can reveal a new destination, and this is Gem Lake. Well, it's time for Yellow to go, and they are going to hike, despite the fact that there's currently a thunderstorm happening. That thunderstorm says they have to spend one fire token, and they also have a water natural resource showing up on their map pack for the next part of their hike. So they will spend each of those, and then they'll reach this part of the trail without suffering any hardships. After that, it's time for the blue player to go, and they want to go over here and explore a destination. This is their last track token, so it appears they've decided to not bother hiking today with this thunderstorm happening. Instead, they're going to head over and explore Gem Lake. This is going to cost them a water, earth, air, and fire natural resource, as well as one of their condition personal resources. After that, it looks like they're going to go fishing at the lake. They already have their fishing pole in their backpack, so that will activate and will advance them once on the elevation chart. And when that happens, they reach the third spot, and that lets them take one natural resource of their choice as a bonus. Well, they currently only have one water natural resource, and they have no bottled water over here to consume during sunset. So they are definitely going to take a water natural resource, and they can convert these two into a bottled water to then consume later on, so they don't have to take a hardship instead. After that, Gem Lake will get them 7 points, which brings them up to 13. And then finally, we can see this is the first lake that they've taken. That means they can cover this up, and as a bonus, they will gain a random field guide card and all benefits on it. This shows the Wilderness First Responder patch. They don't currently have that on their backpack, so they can add it to their backpack. And then this Great Horned Owl <laughs> will actually let them immediately take another field guide card as a reward. So they can draw that one, and this also shows the Wilderness First Responder patch. Well, they have that on their board now, so they can use that to go up once on the elevation chart, which brings them here, and they are just two advancements away from unlocking their fourth track token. That mountain lion they just discovered will also get them two points. So overall, they gained one destination as well as two field guide cards, and they aren't hiking, but they felt like that was a pretty good turn for them. They can finish it up by drawing another destination card, and this is Thousand Island Lake. Well, it's time for us to take the last action of the round, and I think let's go hiking. We are heading to the second spot along the John Muir Trail, which means we are going to have to spend one Fire Natural token, and then of course we also want to spend a Fire Natural token to not take a hardship for the thunderstorm that is currently happening. So we spent both of those and we don't have to take any hardships, and the next time we hike we will have to spend one Water Natural resource. Well, at this point the daylight is fading into sunset, and now it's time for everybody to eat one food and drink one personal water. We had no problem with that. The yellow player also doesn't have a problem with that, although they have no personal water left. And then over here, the blue player does not have any personal water, but they do have the food. Now, of course, you do take a hardship if you can't pay this. But as I mentioned before, at this moment, they can spend two of their natural water resource to turn that into bottled water, which they will then immediately consume as part of the sunset phase. After that, we can all retrieve our track tokens and then refresh the field guide cards. If there was a card here, we would discard it. Obviously there isn't, and then now we shift everything down and reveal a new card, this one being a Larkspur Flower. 
After that, if the first light token was on the board, we would add one water to it, but it is not. And that means we can move into the final step of the sunset, where we evaluate the Trailblazer Medallion. Remember, normally this would just pass clockwise unless somebody took the first light medallion. In that case, the player with the first light medallion will gain the Trailblazer Medallion, so that'll stay over here with yellow. And then the first light emblem will be placed back onto the board, along with a single water natural resource. At this point, the sun has fully set, and we now move into the third day of the game. At this point, I actually want to talk a little bit more about how the game ends and how we gain our final scores. Now, the game is always going to end once we fully complete 12 days. The only exception is that when we get to the sunset phase in day 12, we stop immediately after consuming one food and one personal water. We don't do any of the other sunset steps, and then we proceed directly into final scoring. During final scoring, the first thing that we do is count up the number of hardship tokens each player has. If a player has no hardship tokens, then they don't suffer any penalties. If they have one, then they lose four points. If they have two, then they lose nine. If they have three, they lose 16. And if they have four, they lose 25 points. After that, we will score each medallion that is in front of a player. The Sequoia Medallion is worth two points per player in the game, so six points in a three-player game. And remember, you gain this and keep it if you're the first person to discover one of each of the four different types of destinations. The next medallion is the Windrose. You gain this if you are the first person to get to the top of Mount Whitney, and this is worth one point per player in the game, so three points in a three-player game. After that, if you took the first light medallion during the 12th day, you will currently have that in front of you, and that is going to be worth three points to you. And finally, if you have the Trailblazer token in front of you because you were the first player in the 12th day, then that will be worth two points to you. Once again, during the 12th day, we stop the sunset phase immediately after eating and drinking, so we do not reset the first light medallion, and we don't pass the Trailblazer medallion. I suppose this means if you take the first light token in the 11th day, that will guarantee you are the starting player with the Trailblazer Medallion in the 12th day, so taking the first light medallion on the 11th day is effectively worth two points. After that, we can then score for sets of different field guide cards that we've picked up. Obviously, we've not done a very good job of getting different cards at this point in the game, but we now make different sets where each one of these cards is different, and then a set that has two unique cards in it is worth one point, a set with three unique is worth two, a set with four unique is worth four points, and then finally, each set with all five of the different field guide icons is worth seven points. That means right now we actually have no points because you have to have at least two different cards in a set to get any points from them. After this, every player will score the bonuses from the Golden Arrowhead. Remember, this is something that applies to all players, and the points are doubled for this one. Once again, in this game, players are going to get 6, 10, or 14 points if they have 2, 3, or 4 of the Lake Destination cards that they've explored throughout the game. After that, each player will score any of these arrowhead tokens that they've acquired through the game, and remember, you get these when you reach these three specific spots along the elevation chart. Nobody's gained any of these just yet, but we can focus in and see some examples. We've talked about this one already, which gives you points for the animal field guide cards you have, but then this one gives you two points for each backpack patch you have, up to a maximum of six points. Now, it's a max of six points because there are only three different types of patches that you can gain throughout the game, whereas there are nine pieces of gear. So effectively, if you take this, you're going to want to try and have all three of those patches on your backpack in order to get the most points from it. The final one that we have face up currently is this one. It's worth nine points if you have at least three of each one of the four different type of destination icon cards. And instead, it's worth five points if you have at least two of each one of the four different destination icon types. Once again, as people start to take these, we will flip up new ones, and there will usually be three of these face up, although later on in the game there might be less if one of these stacks has all of its arrowhead tokens taken. Now, the last thing to mention as part of final scoring is if any player did not end the game at the 10th spot, which is the Mount Whitney Peak, then they actually have a functional score of zero, so there's no reason for them to score anything. Remember, you must hike in 10 out of the game's 12 days in order to score points at the end. At this point, the player who reached Mount Whitney and who has the most points will be the winner, and if there is a tie, then the tie is broken by the tied player who reached Mount Whitney first.
Well, at this point, it's now time for the third day out of 12 in this overall hike, but at this point, I think I'm actually going to stop playing through the game. I've now taught essentially all of the rules to the game, and that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope that you enjoyed learning how to play Trailblazer, the John Muir Trail, and I do want to ask that if while you're watching this, some part of the game jumped out to you, or if you maybe saw a turn where we should have done something differently, then please comment about that down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.